Hi, I'm not Cory, and this video was adapted from a thread that I posted over on Twitter a little while ago, so if you enjoy it, why not go and follow me there? You've seen the title of the video, now obviously I will never personally experience an abortion. For one thing, I don't have a womb, and for another, I'm 25, so I'm pretty sure I have blown way past the third trimester. But I did just find out that it is in fact possible to care about things that don't directly affect you. Who'd have thought, right? And so the overturning of Roe v Wade in the States and the less than stellar faith-led politics of one of Scotland's candidates for first minister have really got this topic on my mind. So here it is, my argument for why abortion is fine, even if it is killing fetuses. What I find interesting about the pro-life side of the debate is that you can't necessarily fault someone's genuinely held belief that a fetus is equal to a human life. The issue is the logic that leads from that core belief to the belief that abortion is universally wrong. Obviously, we can completely disregard those for whom it's a religious argument because there's no underlying logic there, so it's pretty boring to dissect. Outside of pointing out inconsistencies in which teachings they choose to follow. Nah, the interesting argument is the secular one. And it's interesting because it kind of sidesteps the question of why killing a person is bad. I know it seems frivolous to ask why such obviously bad things are bad. We all agree that killing is bad and that you shouldn't do it. I'm not arguing against that. I'm just trying to understand the reasonings behind why killing is bad bad. And it's really important to ask these kinds of questions because it leads to a much more consistent ethical framework. The Lord has handed down to us 10 commandments by which to live. So what is it exactly that makes killing bad? We can mostly all agree that ending another human life is a bad thing to do. You shouldn't do it. But it is easy to forget that it's not seen as a universally bad thing by most people. There are some exceptions that make it way more acceptable to do. Although we don't all necessarily agree on what those exceptions are. And ignoring that can be a problem. Here are just a few exceptions. You've got euthanasia, preventing or reducing harm, and as punishment. Now I'm struggling to think of many more, but if you've got any in the tank, why don't you let me know down in the comments. But what I'm interested in is what these exceptions can tell us. Like, is there a pattern at all? Well, euthanasia is a method of stopping any further suffering and preventing harm can also be described as reducing overall suffering and using death as punishment. Well, that can be seen as just preventing harm for the greater population. So at the core of all of these is preventing harm and suffering or reducing harm and suffering overall. But there is a bit of a spanner in the works if we consider another unacceptable scenario, which is suicide. Now with suicide, that prevents any further suffering of the individual. And like euthanasia, it also requires the consent of the person being killed. So why is suicide bad? Now bear in mind, I'm not saying this is a valid solution, at all, or even that it's remotely good. If you're having these thoughts or feelings, I've got some crisis numbers and links in the description. But broadly, the two reasons that suicide is unacceptable are the consent being dubious because of mental illness and there being other options to reduce the suffering. So consent of the person is not enough to justify death alone and prevention of suffering is only an acceptable reason when there is no other option. Obviously. Okay, so we know that killing is only acceptable to reduce harm when there is no other practical solution. And the consent of the deceased is only a determining factor when it's their suffering that is being prevented. But what about capital punishment? Yeah. Capital punishment doesn't work as a deterrent, which means that it doesn't reduce harm by stopping people from wanting to commit serious violent crimes. And it doesn't significantly reduce the suffering of the victims or their families. And realistically, it doesn't reduce any overall suffering more so than life imprisonment would. Even with all of the evidence against it, there are still plenty of people who still support it because it's seen as the most severe punishment and bad people deserve to be punished. So in the case of capital punishment, the harm done to the individual and their loved ones is acceptable because they are bad. Bad people. But what does any of this have to do with abortion? Well, first off, it's actually a pretty solid defense of anti-abortion arguments. Killing is almost universally bad, and so killing an unborn baby, as pro-lifers see a fetus, is also bad because it doesn't fall into any of the general exceptions to that rule. But that is ignoring a key question. What is harm 
and how do we measure it? See, we know that killing is only appropriate when the maths works out in that harm equation, but necessarily we need to compare different kinds of harm in order to figure out the answer. Killing someone generally causes great harm to them, their loved ones, and also the killer. We need to take all of that and weigh it up against the harm that can be prevented by both lethal and non-lethal methods. These factors all hold variable value and can tip the scales in either direction depending on the circumstances. So with euthanasia, the potential suffering of the family is valued less than the suffering of the individual who wants to die. And with self-defense, both outcomes are broadly the same. One person dies and many other people suffer in mourning that person. However, if you choose to cause great harm to someone else, that means that we value your suffering and the suffering of your loved ones less. This demonstrates two things that I find quite interesting. First, the relative harm caused by death is not constant because euthanasia reduces suffering using death. And suffering can have a variable weight depending on specific moral circumstances. I am choosing to switch tracks so that way I only kill one person. There is another situation that's an acceptable method of death that I've neglected to mention until now withdrawal of life support. Now you could make the argument that this isn't necessarily intentionally killing someone because if you remove life support, that doesn't mean that the person is necessarily going to die. Also, they're only living in the first place because of the life support, but that then leads to questions of whether knowingly allowing someone to die through inaction is equivalent to intentionally killing them. Both options present further problems. If inaction equals murder, then at what point does it become acceptable to not help someone to survive? When do we divert resources from those who are on life support to other people who are suffering. Where do we draw that line? If inaction is not equal to murder, then what's the problem with neglecting a baby or the elderly or a disabled person or literally anyone who requires support from others in order to survive? The easy answer to both is twofold, suffering and then current or potential consciousness and awareness. A person on life support is unlikely to experience much suffering because they're unlikely to be conscious or aware of any suffering. Although that's not always necessarily the case. But this does tell us that consciousness or awareness seems to be another factor in that harm equation. So if we think about our anti-abortion stance again, we've actually touched on a bit of an oversight. I'm a math magician. Prepare to marvel as I make this remainder disappear. <laughs> we've assumed that the absolute harm caused by death is a constant regardless of circumstances, despite that not really necessarily being the case with all other acceptable forms of killing. You can almost get around this by opposing all intentional killing regardless of any justifications, although you'll probably stumble at the question, what makes killing wrong? It's a pretty tough question to answer without falling back on religion or it just is, which a lot of people tend to do. There is a really straightforward answer though, it's just completely incompatible with an absolutist stance. Killing isn't necessarily inherently wrong. The issue lies in the harm and suffering that it causes alongside the violation of consent and bodily autonomy. So let's apply all of this to our anti-abortion stance and build that harm equation starting with the harm caused. Abortion may cause pain signals to be sent within the fetus, it could also violate the fetus's potential bodily autonomy, and also it could cause emotional harm to the parent. And when it comes to the harm prevented, pregnancy could cause physical or emotional harm to the parent, raising an unwanted child could cause harm to all parties, raising a child that you're not financially ready for could also cause harm to all parties involved, and so could putting a child up for adoption. That could cause harm to all parties involved. There are some important notes and caveats. First, a fetus generally can't consciously experience pain or suffering. Kind of like an oyster, yeah, the signals are going to be sent, but there's no conscious awareness of that and pain isn't just a signal there's also got to be that kind of awareness of that signal for it to really be pain right and then the second caveat the parent who's carrying the fetus would generally be consenting to the abortion it's very important to note that the third caveat is that the current adoption system is pretty terrible for adoptees i'm not going to speak very much on this here but there are plenty of people all across the internet who would be happy to tell you about it and you will not be hard pressed to find them my fourth and final caveat is that the fetus is bodily autonomous autonomy doesn't really exist yet. It's just the potential for bodily autonomy because it is not and has never been conscious or aware. And it's pretty hard to have bodily autonomy 
if you're not a conscious being and have never been a conscious being. So the harm caused is a bit different than it initially seemed because the fetus isn't necessarily consciously experiencing any pain and its bodily autonomy is only hypothetical and all of the harm that is done to the parents is done so consensually. And also the alternatives could cause physical and psychological damage. Now we can build a new harm equation using this knowledge. We know that the alternative options, adoption and keeping it, aren't themselves harm free. We also know that the harm that's being done is relatively low and primarily to non-conscious beings. And we also know that the harm that's being prevented is exclusively to conscious beings. Taking all of this into account, it seems that abortion causes far less harm than other circumstances wherein killing is acceptable. We almost have to come to the conclusion that even if a fetus is equivalent to a human life, that is not enough to justify an anti-abortion stance. That was a video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and leave a like, comment down below your thoughts, and maybe subscribe if you really do enjoy my content and want to see more. And if you really, really, really like this, go ahead and join my Patreon. People's names are scrolling by here. You don't just get that, you get early access to videos and some bonus videos too, and a couple other cool things here and there, like shout outs that I'm about to do now. So a big thank you to my patrons, all of you, but especially Especially to Haley Stoyanov, I should have read that at first, Prince of Horror, Maul, Christopher A. Butler, Ataraxia25, Utterly Casey, Danito, and Brad the Music Duck. Thank you all very, very, very much, and thank you for watching. I think that's it from me. Goodbye.